Yeah, sign an autograph. That was really a hell of a show tonight. There's a Gibson guitar. It says Gibson on it. It's actually, um, I'll do this close. This is a piano that Les uses a lot. You see Les Paul on it. Gibson. It's a signature. It's kind of like that. And those are Gibson speakers. Everything here is something Gibson owns, you know what I mean? <laughs> I got you, my brother. <laughs> oh, that's less his man, Chris. <laughs> you sure did. Now you don't want to. You want to take that like the last guy? Yeah, I have one like that. Yep. It's about four years, old, three years yep. old now. I have one. I had to buy another one because uh, mine broke, and I bought one just to put the tapes back. They work. Good camera. It I'm happy. I'm not good with it, but I'm happy Are with it. Are you taking this back? Oh, yeah. Of course. Good. I'm standing by for you. Good. Literally. It's a good busy day. It's like struggling people. I love that. Yeah, it's been a hell of a busy day. Yeah, I've done my thing. It's bad news, man. It's trash. It's just a whole thing. It's really hard to work. Yeah. So is somebody just trying to rip it off? Hey, you know what I mean? One last one. <laughs> Michael. I have a choice to that in the calendar, I think I'll take that. You are the man. God bless you, Les. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I've been playing since I was nine. I love you, man. Bless your heart. Bless your heart, man. But I really want young man. Just a couple. How are you guys in the band? I'll get the new sign right there. Beautiful. Glass. Thank you so much. Just a beautiful work. Thank you so much. Thank you. There's Mark. Where's my buddy? You signed his guitar. Thank you, Les. And thanks for your performance. One picture only to him. Hey, it was great. Fantastic. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we do each other here. <laughs> For, 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 for me, it was excellent. Why? All the gifts were for the local ones. There's David. Ha 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 ha! I got you, Tom. Stand by the bus. I want to get you by the bus. Yeah, that part's clean. See, we can handle that. Right. There we go. We're in Las Vegas. What, January 10th, David? Something like that. January 9th. Oh, 9th, yeah. And it was David's birthday the day before yesterday. Oh, yeah. We had a good time. Did you have a good time, oh, really? It was great. And it was a good convention. It was great. Can't do, any Can't do any better. Yep. And we're going, are you going to uh, Nam with us? Yes. And then you going to Austin? I might go to Austin. We're going to go Sundance, too, I guess. Oh, are you? I think so, yeah. But this is David Berman, and I can't get rid of David. I just love him to death, but I, every time I turn around, he's here. Ha, <laughs> ha,
in those days and stuff and you know what, no no how, how, was, how do you see the process has changed over the years <laughs> yeah, yeah. it was the process it would be <laughs> changed because i'm a lot smarter than i was then i didn't have a manager and i and i didn't think much about patenting anything it was pleasing my mother <laughs> just getting the job done wow right and uh i should have uh, fred waring came to me and he's no longer I'm not working for him, but I happen to be a part of a lot of that from where it is. And he heard this for the first time, and he saw us in our infancy mm -hmm. doing these things. Right. With Mary and I singing and playing and making all these different sounds. He says, we should take you to Washington, and we should protect this. It should, it should be uh, cotton copyrighted. So I wasn't a very good man. So, so you learned along the way then? I learned, oh, yes, I learned along yeah, the way. protect those ideas because yeah. they're, they're precious. Absolutely. You know, they're inspirational and they're very precious. Um, let's see what other questions I have for you. Um, you know, now that everything is digital and you have modeling this and, and so forth, uh, where, where does tape um, hold a place for in your heart? Do you still use a, a lot of tape or prefer uh, you know, a tape recorder or um, both? Really? Uh, one is because I started on tape uh, it was in 1945 that I was with the Andrews sisters mm -hmm. on the same tour that ended up with the, in, in Las Vegas where I jumped the ship. Uh -huh. uh, it was at that time I was playing uh, with Paul Lightman. And there was a little guy, and he had a drawn his my attention, by waving at me. And finally, I walked over to him and said, Are you trying to contact me here? And he says, Yes, sir. He says, Well, man, I'm trying to play for a quick break. And I said, Dick, what can I do for you? And he said, Well, Fairchild, Sherman Fairchild was a very dear friend of mine. And he was one of the Fairchild airplanes, Fairchild cameras, even like old law armies. <laughs> so Fair, uh, uh, Colonel Langer said to me, I have something you might be interested in. I have a tape machine. We confiscated it from the Germans. 45 was the end of the war. Right. And when they walked in and saw that Hitler had, when the Nazis had these tape machines, they brought them home. And Colonel Richard had one, and he took me to Melville, New Jersey. And uh, I was with Judy Garland in New York at the time, with Paul White, which I was Sunday. And I went over there, and I heard the first tours. And I said to Big Cloud, I said, now you can be on the golf course. I said, this is heaven for you. <laughs> okay. And when the first one was built by Am, one of the first ones, uh, all of a sudden, they come in my garage, but I'm doing what my mother told me. Right. Yeah, and I'm developing my own thing. And they come in, they said, hi, Les. And I was busy recording with my disc recorder, um, making delay, okay. and, and all these different multi track And uh, they said, hey, I got something for you. And I was in the truck of my car. So I figured it was either a truck full of cheese, craft <laughs> cheese, or a Philco radio or something. I right. didn't know, you know. Right. And so Big lifts the truck up and there's two handles on it, some big box, so we the table sheet. Oh, wow. And we carried it in the backyard. He says, toodaloo, have fun with it. And it sat there for an hour. And uh, I was busy. Mary was doing laundry and hanging it on the line and I was outside in, the, in my studio garage and doing it with this and I looked at that tape machine and I said, oh my god, I said, yeah, it doesn't go. And there in front of me, and all I had to do was have a fourth head in front of me and I got sound down the sound. And I said, Mary, forget the laundry. Everything. We're going to pack the car and take it with me and take the sheet. She says, what's that? I says, I'll 
And by the time we got to New Mexico, driving to Chicago to play the Blue Note in Chicago, I told her about it. And I said, here it is, it's right on an envelope. I got it all drawn out. I said, it's going to do this, this, and this. She says, you've never built one. You've never tried it. What if it doesn't work? So I said, well, it'll work. By the time we got in there, the state of Illinois, I wasn't sure it was going to work. So Mary was convincing me gradually that maybe I should have tried this thing when I was going to jump ahead of what was actually going to take place. Right. And uh, when we got to the New Lawrence Hotel, I had calls and Pex Hotel that I needed other heads, so they figured mine was blown. Right. But I blew the head out. Okay. I, I didn't tell them I put the fourth head out in front of them. And I'd have sound on sound. So we made, we made all of them. All of them. Uh, Lover was on disc. Okay, Brazil, Caravan, those were on disc. But then we switched over. Okay. And from, from after, uh, yeah, from Tennessee Walls to Mockingbird Hill to How High the Moon, right. World's Way for the Sun, right. all the rest of them were done on this day. Wow. Yeah. On that particular machine? On that particular machine. Do you, do you still own that, that machine? Oh, I got that machine that's going in the Smithsonian. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So I'm very proud of that. That was the beginning. And so I know more than finished building that one. And my idea led up, I said, gee, we're going to do sound, uh, send sound on sound, make a multi-track machine, <laughs> and make it easier. Right. Okay. And uh, he turned down, like I said, and I put my that and I said, we can do it. Wow. And that's how that was born. But it was born always with people saying, no, I can't be done. Right. And you have to have the faith in you. Your belief that it can be done. Right. And all it takes is just guts to go out there and turn it. I wish I could do it. A lot of people try to trip it, you know. Sure. They, they don't, I don't know, they just don't pick up. When I took the first recording, mm -hmm. I took the first recording, multi times recording, a lover, and I took it to Denver. Rebecca listened to it and says, uh, it's maybe, maybe one. One hit us. Okay. So I went over to Victor, and Victor was more fascinated because of the union difficulty in the position, not the engineer. The engineers you were difficulty. So I walked out of NBC and I saw him putting up a pan for sun that's in Capital. I walked over there and I said, How do I get to see the president? We're closing at 5 o'clock. So people were coming out of the building. Not the round building. This is before the round okay. building. Okay. So it was right across from NBC. So I backed up the stairway. Got to the top of the stairs and I saw Vice President so I went in. He was cocking his toothbrush and everything to leave. And I said, Can I play a record for you? And he said, What's your name? I said, Wes Paul. He said, Why don't you have so Jim says, I can play it, but he says, I don't know how to run the thing. I said, I know how to run it. And I put the needle down on the record. I played Lover. He grabbed an envelope. And he wrote down there, we have an agreement. Wow. So we made it on an envelope, and that was it. I got myself started with the top of The rest is history. It's, it's an incredible story. It is incredible. It's just people that bleed. And he was one of those. And you believe too, obviously. Sure, you know, I believe. Yeah, but Decca, Decca didn't believe in me. And, I, and uh, Dave was dead. Uh, Jack was dead. So it was Dave Cap that had doubts that uh, this, this was only the beginning. This is my first attempt after locking me in the garage. You know, uh, Big Crosby called and said, What are you locking yourself in the garage for? because of my mother. <laughs> she told me to come up with something new and different. I sure as hell got it. <laughs> Do you think that uh, tape sounds warmer to you? I mean, the difference in sound between the tape and digital and stuff, uh, what, 
what is your uh, of course there's different yeah sure yeah there's to you I mean, analog and digital there's a difference there's a difference between two tracks sure there's differences right and it's a question of uh, of, of correcting the problem making less of a difference uh, but we're not going to go back we're going ahead right and so uh, what are we listening to no matter what it is, you know, if you just go up and down this strip, it'd be hard for you to find tools. It's all, it's all transistors. And if it's not transistors, it's chips. And if it's, if it's not analog, which is a fast falling off, right. but digital coming in, digital's where we're going to go. Right. It's a matter of uh, perfecting it more, right. getting it to where we're happy with it. Right. In the meantime, if you have a choice and you have a good guitar tube amplifier, it gives you that good sound. It's a warmer sound. It has the type of distortion that's complementary. Right. And you just, uh, you have the right to choose what you wish. What um, uh, kinds of amplifiers uh, have you used over the years? I've used them all. Yeah. I think any, any, any one of them that just really, that have a fancy for? Uh, there, uh, there's something to be desired in all of them, but it's in, the, it's in right now we're in, in, in the crossover period. We're about to change. Right. And uh, the weakest link in the chain is not so much in analog digital as it is in the speaker. The speaker is probably the weakest link in our chain. It has been. Okay, and so the speaker, in order to get a decent response, has to divide the labor into four parts. Then you got the super highs up here, you got the highs up here, then you got the medium range down here, then you got the woofer down there. You know, mm -hmm. if you really want to get crazy about it, then you put a subwoofer in Right. And with the things of the way they're going today, the way they're pumping that stuff up, uh, now I'm wearing hair again, so you can imagine what happened. When I get in there, and they really, I just left the place where they were cooking with a bass just so I was to hit one note and my, my ears collapse. Wow. And just a little bit. But, but that goes through your ears too. Right. You're so doing damage to them and everything else. So, just so some, some, in some cases, I'm saying we're pushing it a little too far. Was it uh, kind of like an amp war? Kind of shoot out back uh, in the early days, you know, sure. for everyone to build a bigger, stronger amplifier and stuff. Was that kind of like where, you know, yep, yep. that's where the battleground yep. was. Sure, the battleground. Yeah, and it's still there. Yeah, and it's still there. We're trying to get, we're trying to do it better and better, and, better. and they are getting better. And better. Right. I know. It's just taking time, and I think save a buck or half a buck or ten cents. They're going to do it another way. You know, sit there and think about it. Say, well, our best friend is a transformer. Well, not now. We're going to transform. They say, we're going to get rid of the transformer. That costs $8 to get rid of it. Right. Do it without a transformer. Right. And the microphone's the same way. We would kill for a transformer. We'd go into Guitar Center now. Right. And we'd buy something for $85 and we'd pay. 2004, right, right, right. 50 years ago, right? sure, sure. So times have changed, and they're for the better, right. I so agree. I look, I look at the whole, at the whole picture. And say, well, we're getting better all the time. Well, yeah, I've always wanted to ask you that because so much uh, attention, you know, is always focused on the guitar, the Les Paul guitar, and you know, I just wanted to know what what you feel complements your guitar, you know, well, as my, in, in terms of my interest. guitar, the way I think. That it is, that you get the best of both worlds, and you're never going to get all of anything that you do with anything that you put a string on, because wherever you put the string on, there is only part of the full output of that string, right. the bandwidth of that whole string, and it has notes and has problems. All the things associated with uh, picking that pickup up. Part of it. It's what you do with the part that you got, the part, the part that you could deal with, and right. what is necessary to get the message across. 
And if you listen to the first guitar I made and listen to the one that's made today, it, let's say it's 50 years different. Okay. I swear to Christ, there's no difference between the one 50 years and the one that's out there. <laughs> What about the vintage market and stuff? Did you ever imagine oh. in, in 1958 that uh, you know Les Paul guitar would go for you know a couple hundred thousand dollars? I, I went to the Gibson people <laughs> and I, I I I drew it to their attention in a big hurry. I said, hey, what you fellas don't know at Gibson is that the guys are running up and down the street. All these young guys are running up and down the street, going from 148th Street to New York. Running up and down the street trying to find a less blown guitar. <laughs> okay. And I said, You guys aren't building. You quit building. You phased them out. Right. And you figured that you're dead? I said, You're just starting out. <laughs> I said, The thing to do is to turn around and give them what they want. Right. Okay. So what, as, what made me turn on to that is that I was driving up 48th Street and a guy says, he, he was had, traffic was heavy and he came out he says hey Les and I, I said yeah I says what's happening he says I just closed shop he says I sold one Les Paul for ten thousand dollars he says that's all I want for today <laughs> he says I'm all done and he says the place is going crazy I called Gibson up and I says hey you have no idea what a market there is for your guitar out there and we're ignoring it. We're ignoring it. So we went into big production and turned it big around. Do you have all the old, uh, the prototype ones and the? Sure. Yeah. You kept all those. Yeah. Was there was there ever one that you had sold or given away that is or not maybe a Les Paul but any other your guitars that you sold or gave away and you really you really regret it? I just it? finished writing a book. Yes. Wow. There is. And when I left Chicago to go to New York. And this is uh, in the 30s. I gave away, I had six guitars, I gave five away in Capricorn. And I said, I'm going to New York, I only need one guitar. <laughs> and the other five I gave away. And one, uh, two of the five showed up in the last few years. One of them, the kid was dying. And he had my first L5. And he had it under a bed. Dying, he said to his mother, he said, uh, I wish you'd do me a favor and find the rightful owner of this guitar. He gave it to me. His name was Dick Warren. And when he died, the mother wrote me a letter. I went to Chicago and I got my guitar back. The first guitar, first L5 Gibson I ever had. That one I told you uh, earlier, right, right, started, that one. it came back to me. And if you could believe this, two weeks ago down at the Iridium in New York, the woman comes in there and she says, I have a guitar. And she says, I bought it down in Key West, Florida. And she said, I took it to George Bruin. He couldn't find any history on it. And she says, it's just a strange guitar, but I like it. I said, what make it? She says, national. I said, that's odd. I said, I made one for national. They only made one. <laughs> and I says, if you got a national to tell me, explain to me what it looks like. She said, it's blonde and don't have any F holes. I said, that's my guitar. And I just finished writing a book. And that's what the book says. And it's in the book. And in the book, I write that I never knew what happened to the guitar. I gave it away to somebody. That's the end of it. But I said that's one of the first guitars that I ever made that was a solid body back in 1932, 33. Wow. In that time for, for, for uh, Nashville guitar. And she, I said, if you send me a picture, I'll know. And I'll be honest with you and tell you. She sent me a picture of this investment. There it is. And I explained to her what it looked like, exactly what was on it. And it's like, uh, she sent me the picture. I sent it down to Gibson. 
I said, you want to see the first solid body? There it is. Wow. Yeah. And it's funny how things come back. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You don't go looking for them. They come to you. I do. Yeah. And that's just This one fun. found me. Yeah. Yeah. They all found me. Yeah. Well, I think that's... You a, got it? Yeah. There so. you are. Done. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. We really appreciate it. All right. Do you have any questions for me, Chris? Just one quick one. How, how do you think the, uh, the guitars that are coming out today compare to the original? Well, that's an easy one. <laughs> the, the guitars today are not only do they look better, not only do they play better, we've learned how to make the guitar closer to a perfect instrument than we have in the past. In the early days, we had the old timers who brought them down by hand and you got one out of ten. It was good. Okay, today you get nine out of ten. But, and they, we've made a vast improvement in the finishing of the instrument, all the gingerbread on the instrument. We've learned how to wind the coil better, we learn how to make everything about the guitar better than the old one. But there's that old fantasy that the old one's better. And I don't argue with it. I don't argue with it. Because I have to have one old guitar in my collection that was a prototype, and they've yet to make it sound as good as the ones I've got now. And so it does happen, and uh, it's a phenomenon of many things, of many variety of things that make it possible that one guitar is better than another. You get a dozen apples in our life, they're all different. You get 10 people in this bus sitting here, and they're, they're all people, but they're, and they're all men, and they could be the same age, but they got different fingerprints, they're different people. All right, all right. That's great. Can I get the one comment on Jimmy Rogers? Let me okay. get the Jimmy. Okay. Let's get, let me pull that real quick. Sure. Thank you, Thank you very much, Terry. You're nice. very welcome. Thank very you. Well. Really inspirational. All right. Great. God, it's about really. Oh my God! What yeah. a great history. Just the first <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we sitting on it? <laughs> Hang on. Let me just yeah. see if the sound. Okay. okay. You really inspired me, Wes. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. It's a story about believing. Huh? Are we all done? <laughs> Now let me get this Jimmy Rogers thing real quick. Okay. God, I I'll can't just miss hold that yet. Yeah, it's all, it's already on here. Yeah, yeah, it's already there. All right, here we get the line on. Lights on. Yeah, yeah, here we go. Okay. Yeah, just just uh, tell how Jimmy influenced you, Jimmy Rogers, and. Well, when I was just a kid, I heard Jimmy Rogers for the first time coming out of. Oh shit! Wait, I'm sorry. Battery. Went. <laughs> you got a charge? No, yeah, I think. Let me see. I think this battery here. I mean, we, you know, you can use our camera. Yeah, I think uh, this I think battery. I think I got a little bit on this battery okay. left. Oh. Uh, okay. Jimmy Rogers? Yeah. Well, Jimmy came into my life when I uh, got my first radio. Uh, first one that you could put in the wall. My mother used to be a, a not on dialing. She loved country music and she loved uh, to get the far away station. And so in come Jimmy Rogers. And uh, when I heard him singing uh, blues number one, blues number two, and uh, all, all of, I'm in the jailhouse now, and TV blues and all those things. It was Jimmy Rogers. Uh, he was the first one that fascinated me with uh, reverb and echo. And I heard him singing in a studio that was empty with no curtains hanging on the wall, no lugs on the floor, and he was a mile away from the microphone. And as much as I was uh, eating up his, his, uh, his songs, 
what he was doing in his performance. I was also interested in the acoustical sounds. The acoustical sounds intrigued me more uh, as I listened to them. And uh, so to create my myself to sound like Jimmy Rogers, I ended up singing in the bathroom. And then uh, I started to move the chair out of the bathroom more toward the bedroom. The bedroom had mattresses and rugs on the floor and curtains on the walls. And it was a dead room. And it was there that I found that if I put the chair at a certain distance between live and dead end, it was the best sound that I could uh, simulate to the sound he was getting. And in doing that, <clears throat> I heard it, but I then said, I better build a recording machine so I could hear this and know for sure what it sounds like on a recording. And so that's when I started getting into electronics and recordings and making my own. And that is so that I could hear that I was simulating the sound of Jimmy Rogers uh, with, with the type of echo and the amount of echo that I wish to get. So it's a longer room, more tile, less tile, dead room, and that was the beginning of it. It was a terribly interesting thing because Jimmy Rogers did more for me than just the songs that he was singing and his style of music. I was also interested and the way I was going to uh, mimic those sounds. And that's how echo got into my, my head, uh, the reverb, the delay, all those things. It took years to figure out what is common to the kid today. He just goes down to the store and he buys a reverb. You know, and my chance out of 10 is going to uh, be somewhat satisfied with what he's got there, which is less complicated than me with my chair between the bedroom and the bathroom, <laughs> trying to get that sound in person here on the strip. Far cry from that. But that's uh, some of the things that uh, intrigue me with Jimmy Rogers, besides his creation whole style of playing and singing with the things that surround him. Perfect. Perfect. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I'm in heaven. <laughs> I, hear I, love, I love you. That's your great. Okay. Oh my gosh. All right. I can't wait to play that for Merle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, Merle knows about it. Yeah. Well, I love... Uh, Please tell him I said... Well, I will. They, uh, he, I think he wants to try to find a time you guys can get, get play together. So yeah. let's...